working on music from being 16 years old to being 44 and then my first goal comes and which is when talking about it you know because you love to drop gems it comes bro like it, it first of all life-changing music is not measured by plaques So today on the podcast, we've got the pleasure of getting AJ on the buttons, Amand AJ Jackson. Welcome to the Midi Money Podcast. Peace. What's up? How are you feeling, well, man? Good, man. I'm excited to talk to you. I was looking through, bro, you sent over these this credits. It's like it's like five DMs with like arranged in all these <laughs> kind of ways. I'm trying to figure out who I should. So, okay. So you've, you've engineered, you've mixed and or recorded for Future. I see Young Thug. Rick Ross, I see some legends on there like Busta Rhymes, Raekwon, Method Man. I mean, bro, this is, I can't, re we'd be here all day. Appreciate How it, man. <laughs> it's very yeah, impressive. I love what I do, man. Appreciate very it. impressive list here. Um, you. So that that's your, that's what you do, right? You, engineering, mixing? Yeah, mixing is my love. It's like literally like, um, you know, once we start talking about it, it's, you know what I mean? It's like, I literally go on for hours and hours and I've known to go on for hours. So, um, yeah, mixing, it's the thing that wakes me up in the morning. It's, it's what gets me motivated. You know, I've, I've tried different veins of the, you know, of the music creation process. Yeah. And like mixing is just what, you know, I really, I know that I'm inside of my calling. You know what I mean? I wake, I never get tired of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I get tired of people sometimes, but I don't get tired of it. You know? get Bro, tired I feel it. I feel it. I've I've done um I've done a lot of engineering. That was really kind of like my main job um for like 10 plus years was, you know, running my studio and, and uh recording and mixing and stuff. So I definitely um I know I know the joys of it and then also especially if you're on the the tracking end, you know, sometimes it's fun to hang out and sometimes it's just like man i'm i'm uh you know i'm i'm an introvert i'm i'm not really like like i have my people and i love being around my people but then um i'm i'm somebody who kind of needs that like alone time to like recharge Thanks. and uh i don't know it's interesting i actually engineered a session for the first time in a while last night and it's like i don't know it's sort of like this weird um it was a weird feeling for me because i hadn't done it in a while um yeah yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Do you still do you still record or are you doing more more on the mixing side? Um, at this point in my career, fortunately, I record when I kind of am excited about somebody. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Um, so one of my brothers calls me up, you know, uh, Sky Zoo or, you know, like a Diamond D or, you know, a couple really close. You know what I mean? Like artists that I'm in love with. You know what I mean? Then I'll do it if it's something you know, critical, I'll do it. But at this point, when I do recording sessions that um, I tend to bring other high level engineers with me and have um, them run the boards, and then I'll mm -hmm. step back and kind of be present with the songwriters and the producers um, and the artist and kind of become a stopgap for the um, other people in the room and the person who's tracking. So that way I can make sure that they can focus on doing their job and I can interpret and get more information from whatever's going on in the room. So I go way macro so that whoever I bring in to actually track can like focus. So they're not Don't like know. getting, you know how it is. It's like, you got songwriters like, yo, do this. And, then, and it's like constant back and forth. It just makes sessions way, way better um 100%. when i come in with a team so yeah that's cool that's cool yeah i know you know the big thing recording is really like the the vibe but a big part of vibe is just is efficiency like i feel like that's right. it's underrated i feel like it's the most underrated part of vibe is efficiency and i think that's why um people like work with me as an engineer because if nothing else i was i'm always fast and i'm always thinking okay what are they going to want to do next and then and then trying to do that so i think anything you can do to create that efficiency to where they're not like having to explain everything or getting frustrated or whatever like that's that's the key is just like how do you make this as simple and and easy as possible to where i feel like when you're tracking you almost want to like um almost like disappear in a way where you're not right. like another personality because you know a lot of times there's a lot of big personalities and everybody's got their opinion all that kind of stuff i usually try to like step back and just 
try to facilitate, you know, making that happen as quickly as possible. That's dope that you have a whole, a a team to make that happen. Um, I haven't really seen that approach. I think, well, it's, it's, it's not normal, um, but it, I'm not normal. So there's that. (laughs) Hey, normal is Uh, boring. (laughs) But I, I just think that um, music is really, really important to me. And um, the, we are servants to the music, especially if you're engineering whether you're mixing or you're recording, you're a servant to the mixing, you know, I mean, to the to the song, right? You're not, yeah. you're, you have to be of service to the people in the room. If you're present, you know what I mean? And if you're not present, you're still being of service to the to the music itself. So um, it's not an ego thing for me. So I'm, it's interesting, but I'm going to bring whoever's on the board their coffee, I'm going to do all of that kind of stuff. Because um, it's not a pride thing. But mm. It, it allows me to see the room from a different perspective and the energy from a different perspective and make sure that my clients are happy. You know what nice. I'm saying? Instead of like, you know, cause I'm going to notice something like mic placement isn't quite right. The recording isn't quite, you know, and then I'll hop on the boards every once in a while and I'll, you know, start doing some EQing and, um, and mix prep inside the, the session when the artist comes out, you know, little stuff like that, man. But I kind of let whoever I bring in, um do that and i just fall back so yeah it nice i don't enjoy tracking the way that i used to it's just (laughs) i think that's a young man's game Um, yes i think that's what it is yeah i don't want to be in a room with a rapper would lean you know for 10 hours or something (laughs) for sure that's not exciting to me for sure um on the mixing side i mean so a lot of the people who are going to listen or watch listen to this or watch it are, are producers um, what are, what are some of the things that you see as far as like, um, that producers maybe should be doing more of or less of as far as when they're making their beats, you know, uh, mixing wise where it's like, ah, they're, you know, they're always messing this up or, or I feel like, you know what I mean? What, what, are, what are some things that, that you see that, that producers can do a better job of as far as, uh, making their beats sound good? Okay. So they, so they call me the producer whisperer. This is a thing. Um, so it's. I absolutely love working with producers. This it's the thing almost every major record that I've mixed um was because of a relationship with a producer. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um but the, the mistakes that I see or the areas of opportunity, I'll say it that way. The areas of opportunity that I tend oh, to see it's very political. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be <laughs> um cuz I think I think producers just kind of like half the time just can't hear. Um <laughs> so <laughs> Because, it, you know, because the emphasis is on is on creating, but the emphasis is, isn't on developing how you perceive what you're creating. You know what I'm saying? So interesting. Um, the That's low end. Well, I know. Sorry, I know you're about to I know you're about to but, drop the gems and I'm cutting you off. But it is interesting because I feel like so much of making beats dope is how it sounds. It's not just mm-hmm. like it's not the it's not just the melody or just the you know you're not just a composer it's really so much of it is how it sounds so i don't know it surprises me a little bit i guess to hear that but it's it's so important like to me it's i I always felt like they they came together so much where it was like the skills from engineering and producing like they really go hand in hand a lot of times it's hard to even um separate those out like i don't know what role am i playing right now because it's like such a big part of producing to me is how does it sound and then when you're engineering right. i think a lot of times you might end up being you know what we need to replace that kick or we need to you know what i mean something that would traditionally be a producer but but anyways i, I didn't mean to cut you off from no no you're good i don't the gems there place um anything in the session um i'm really really good at manipulating frequencies and um sounds and so um if somebody gives me a weak kick then you know i can um reshape the frequencies or even sometimes um transient shape um the kick or the or the bass um, and are you doing that with a compressor or how do you how do you shape those transients mostly dim mostly dynamic eq and then um which is just for y'all that aren't familiar with it a dynamic eq is just an eq that has um, the ability to do compression inside of it, whether it's downward compression or upward compression. Um, so like the fab filter stuff, the um, 
the um, isotope, you know, neutron EQs, like all those kind of EQs are, they're just capable of doing compression and EQing simultaneously. Which right. I it's love. basically like a compressor, but specific to certain frequencies, right? So instead exactly. of like, if it hits this threshold, turn the whole sound down. It's if it hits the threshold in this frequency range, then turn that frequency range down, right? Yep. Turn it down or up. Exactly. Um, so, so that actually brings, is, is a good point. So I think one of the, one of the places where people uh, miss it a lot is in low end, um, especially with things like 808s. I'll try to be a little bit more specific, like things like 808s and bass lines where the 808 or the bass is just one consistent and then it, like it has no decay time. And mm -hmm. so what winds up happening is that you're creating, um, a blanket underneath the record that doesn't allow other things to breathe. And um, I, I, I study and talk a lot about the way the intersection between um, the way the brain perceives sound and what sound actually is. Um, mm -hmm. And the mind kind of needs a rest with with most sounds, it kind of needs a rest. So if the if the bass is running and you get, even if it's a really small, small, small gap before the next hit of the mm -hmm. bass or the 808, um, it gives the mind to, the opportunity to reset and it sets the pace for, um, for the record. So it tends to be a lot better. So every once in a while, I'll have to kind of transient shape um, or use something like an Arvox to kind of gate the tail end of the bass. Um, so that's a thing. I see a lot of people adding um, intense reverbs to adding intense reverbs to things that don't necessarily um, necessarily need a reverb um, mm -hmm. or that the reverb is just this is a better way of saying it. The reverb is not filtered. It's just a reverb. Mm -hmm. So you've got a snare. You just throw a reverb on it and that reverb doesn't have um, oh, is that on, my man? guy. <laughs> go set the, uh, Yo, uh, what's up, bro? How you doing? We got a we got a celebrity appearance on the podcast. Man, realistic. How you doing? I, I show up when I can, man. <laughs> Good to see you, bro. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just uh, gonna fire up my studio. Okay, cool. Does Gabe know how close our studios are? I don't. I don't know. Did you know that that we um are in the same building? No, I don't think I knew that. Yeah, his studio is literally like if I'm I. I'm in my studio right now. Yeah. He's like, oh, like, <laughs> well, that is close. Studio is close. <laughs> like, if I reach, well, I'm not yeah. anywhere near it, but yeah, yeah we're, we're, ah, you touch hands. Shoes. Yeah. So nice. Yeah, it's my guy. And it is the, the first time I've ever done that is, is, um, that I've respected an, an engineer enough to, to actually be in the same space with them. Right. Um, right. But yeah, so, so reverb, right? Reverb yes. really should be filtered or, um, it should be contoured around what the the sound needs for it to be. Gotcha. So, so you're it, saying add an EQ to the reverb, right? When you say filter? Yeah. So the okay, so this is maybe this is something that'll be helpful for people. So um if you were to take a subwoofer and put a subwoofer in the middle of a stadium, um you would hit play on that sub and it would sound pretty far and it wouldn't it wouldn't like give you that fullness, you know what I mean? That you would have if you were in a small room and you put the subwoofer in there. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens with reverb is you are placing, uh, with low end frequencies, you are placing them inside of a, a big space. So if you have a kick drum or you have um, an 808 or any of those kind of things and you add reverb in those low frequency ranges, what you're essentially doing is is removing a lot of its power Mm -hmm. Um, so filtering things like there, like on snares, you know, if you want your snare snare to slap, you probably want to either bring down the reverb in the frequency ranges where the snare is going to snap the most, or to just filter out a lot of the low end inside the snare. So it doesn't, um, make it feel so distant. It can still slap you in the face, but it can have a reverb tail. So I think that's a big place where producers kind of miss it is not, um, actually dialing in the reverbs they're using um, got you so so instead of maybe just having a bus set up with a reverb and just kind of sending stuff there it sounds like you're specifically like you've got your reverb for your snare but then you're gonna 
you know, put a low pass on it or, or, you know, filter out some of, um, some of those frequencies where, where that snare is really hitting and then a different reverb on a di another instrument. Is that, or you can duplicate it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you can duplicate the reverb onto, onto another instrument. So like, if you wanted to do, um, reverb on your hats and your snares are, can feel very similar. You can use the same exact reverb for hats and snares. And that's a, that's a, usually a really wise choice for the, the combination, um, for them to feel in, in sync a little bit, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. For them to feel, um, cohesive, right? Like they mm -hmm. make sense. Um, or, and then, you know, see, I love this kind of stuff. Cause then you can play with like some things, um, you use less reverb on them. So they feel more in your face, you know what I'm saying? And that's kind of like one of the things that I, I don't think people utilize enough also is like have some wet high if you're going to use two or three hi hats maybe have a wet hi hat that um wet wet is in terms of reverb like mm -hmm. wet that matches whatever reverb you've got on your snare but then maybe you have an accent hat that doesn't have much reverb or any reverb on it so it sits in front more mm -hmm. you know what i mean and it makes it feel more dynamic and there's more movement um so that's a place i'm trying to think of other things because that gives it i like that way of thinking about it too because it's kind of like you know, you always think about left and right, but it, but there is sort of that front and back space. And if you put more reverb on it, it's like it's farther back. And if it's less, it's front. So you can kind of like think about, I think, filling up that space front, back, you know, yep. left and right to 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 make it feel more more three dimensional. Yeah, when I'm mixing, sometimes I will literally I, re I do really wild stuff. Um, so I'll sometimes if it's necessary for a song, I may add a reverb in a particular frequency range only um to their instrument just to get it out of the way of another instrument because they're they're so like you said there's there's the frequency spectrum so you're you're um some people have conflicting frequencies but then there's also other conflicts which is like sense of depth con um conflict you know what mm -hmm. i mean so mm -hmm. the vocal you want the vocal to usually feel very present unless you're doing an ad lib and it's like you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, floating out in the ether or whatever. So um, like a, like Amigos ad lib, a Travis Scott ad lib, any of those kind of things, they, they're they massive, right? But the reason why those sound so good with the other vocals, because the, the lead vocal is not that way, just the, the background, you know? Right. So if you think about instruments that way too, you know, it's like having that sense of depth and three dimensional like feel when somebody listens makes it more immersive. Um, mm -hmm. and more, um, almost theatrical or, you know what I mean? It, yeah, it makes... no, it's dope. I like that way of thinking about it. It's like, cause then, cause I guess what you got your left and right. Then you got kind of like depth of field for like more reverb, less reverb. Then you got your frequency. So that's like up and down. And right. I think a lot of it just comes down to making sure each thing has its own space so it can really shine and it's not crowding the other thing. Right right yeah that's it so when i teach that's one of the primary things i teach is how to listen to each instrument find um the frequencies that make sense for that instrument for that song um and then to reduce the things that you don't want as much because the thing by reducing the things that you don't want you get more of what you do want by default if that mm -hmm. makes sense yeah um, so yeah, then you can, then it's automatically creating more space for other things to live. So that's, um, it, sound selection is huge, which is what you were alluding to, which is like, hey, you know, the way that you hear your, your instruments when you're selecting stuff, you know what I mean, is really important. Um, your samples, sure. your pads, all that stuff, the way you hear it is really important. But most people really, you know, they just throw stuff in pads, people just be throwing pads around like they don't. Pads are aggressive, bro. You gotta, you gotta think about that shit, man. You can't just be throwing pads around, like you know. You gotta, you gotta really pads that consume a lot of space on purpose. They consume a lot of space, so you've got to be very deliberate with your pads. You got like, if you want that pad to occupy the low end frequency spectrum, then you know automatically that you're gonna wind up having to side chain your your 808 to your bass to it because it's already hella aggressive in that frequency range. But if yeah. you don't really want it for that, then go ahead and filter it while you're making your beat so that right. you have more room. You know, it's like you got a big old canvas, you got a big old giant white canvas. There's nothing on it at all. 
the more you can keep that canvas clear, the more you understand how much more room you have to play with as you paint. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Nice. So people just be, you know, like, all right, I'm gonna just splash some green on here and some red over there, but they don't really like, a lot of people really don't take time to 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 understand frequencies enough to be able to um, see the mix coming together be while they're making the beat, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't yeah. suggest mixing while you make the beat. That's a bad idea. But. Oh, you don't? That's interesting. So even like what you said, like if you're going to throw a side chain on that pad or a low pass or something, um, are you saying you're saying you don't even recommend doing that when, when you're making a beat? Oh, yeah, th definitely. Th I think that's a good idea. But um, I always advise people, you know, put on your producer hat. You know what I mean? Because mixing and produ producing are kind of left and right brain. Um, mm. And in a lot of ways, I don't want to trap myself in saying that, but they're, they're kind of left and right brain just for the sake of illustrating. So I tell people, put on your producer hat, have fun, make a vibe. You know what I mean? Spend mm -hmm. as little time as you can trying to, you know, deal with the mixing aspect of things so I that see. you can continue to be creative. When you're done with that process, take your producer hat off, open the drawer, get your engineering hat, put that on. And now you're not in the creative space right now. Now you're in the engineering space. Not to say that engineering is not creative, but for the sake of people understanding that I, I, I advise people to, to be polarizing about this um, because when you try to integrate them too much, it slows down the production process, which I don't think is healthy for producers. I think it's, it's better for you to have fun, make a vibe and adjust the really big things on the spot, like you said, you know, like if we're going to filter like the low end out of a pad or, you know, the high end out of something, totally fine to do while you're producing. You just don't want to start grabbing EQ nodes and fine tuning frequencies and that I could do it because I, it's I'm fast like that. But like an average producer, even a, I work with people all the way from Grammys all the way down. I, I tell all those people, stop doing all that, man. Just mm -hmm. just have fun. I got you. When you give me the record, I'll take care of it. <laughs> right. No, that's interesting. I really like that. Because at first, I, I you said that I was kind of, that's kind of not the approach that, that I've taken because I kind of, I do like to think about both at the same time. But I, I think it, it actually makes sense when you explain it more because it's like, yes, if you are going to throw a low pass on it, you know, go ahead and do that because otherwise it's going to be hard to figure out what instrument or whatever to put in next. But I think it's, it actually comes back to what we said before about efficiency. And it's more about, Right. Keeping that vibe. And what are you doing right now? Like if, if you're in that mode of I'm finding new instruments, I'm creating melodies, I'm you know what I mean? Then you don't want to necessarily get bogged down into like finding the exact little, you know, part of the EQ that you're going to, you know, bring right. out or, or, you know, all, all that kind of stuff um, and do kind of like the broad strokes with that stuff. So you can put it together in a way that, you know, doesn't it sounds pretty good. Um, but yeah, I think it comes down to efficiency. And I think that that's interesting because it really carries over into to everything, right? Because we before we were talking about recording, but this applies to like mixing compared to producing. But I think even if you're over on the business and marketing side of things, like the more you can kind of batch things and have mm -hmm. that be in that mindset of like, okay, this is the this is the thing that I'm focusing on. This is the mode that I'm in right now. The more you can batch those things, the more efficient you'll end up being Man. as opposed to like, okay, I'm going to go through steps one, two, three, four, five, six on this. Then I'm going to go steps one, two, three, four, five, six on this. Like, no, just do step one for 10 things. Then do step two for those 10 things. You, it, it takes our brains a while to switch over. And so yeah. I think that that's, that's really smart to just be conscious of that. Um, and, and you'll be way more efficient if you, if you can, the more you can batch this stuff and be in the mode of, okay, right now I'm building my funnel right now. I'm, you know, making this beat right now I'm mixing right now I'm you know answering emails whatever it is um because the opposite is answering an email and then you know <laughs> adding your snare right. and then talking on the phone and then doing this and like it's just it's so inefficient to do that and I think I think it's underestimated sometimes how long it takes for your brain to kind of switch uh switch into that so I think being conscious of that and batching those those all those types of tasks um is is super super helpful Absolutely. And I and also, um, to add to what you're saying, it's also what people don't understand about doing that is you're, you're going to exhaust yourself, you know, by asking your brain to constantly switch tasks that way. Um, yeah. it is, it creates a fatigue, um, that you don't need, even when I mix records. So, um, you know, 
I have a thing that myself and my staff do is called um, core mixing where, well, we do mix prep first. That's, you know, the first thing. So we're batching tasks, which is what you're saying. So we're preparing the record. We're, you know, separating breathing. We are um, volume balancing, which some people call manual compression. We are doing um, labeling the tracks, you know, routing the tracks to the correct buses, color coding, all this kind of stuff. It's very cerebral stuff, right? So that gets done. Then um, we move into core mixing, which is going to be still kind of cerebral stuff, but you're actually handling the audio at that point. So you're doing compression, you're doing um, limiting, you're doing your EQing, you're doing, you know, all of these kind of things. And then after all that stuff is done, we do the creative session. And that's when you can go burn one or go grab a drink and have fun because all of the the like very cerebral task oriented things um are done so now you can have fun and have a drink and smoke and and you know try out some crazy delays and do some you know wild reverbs and like you know because your right. mind and your spirit are no longer burdened by all the tech and this is where people mess up with mixes bad bro they'll 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 start mixing it's like if your mix has taken three days it's mm -hmm. because you started mixing then you had an idea and you now you want you've jumped to the creative side and you haven't even finished the mix prep so now mm -hmm. you've got this idea the idea leads you down this rabbit hole right and then now two hours later you're like oh damn i haven't even um finished labeling my tracks yet you know mm -hmm. what I mean? That's where it becomes your mixes will take a week, two weeks, instead of taking a few hours because you're just doing, you're not doing it in that very, you have to like contain that emotion and just, you know what I mean? For I know sure. it's exciting, but you contain the emotion <laughs> and focus on one thing at a time. And then when you get to the creative side, it's all out of the way and you can just have fun. So I totally agree with you about that. Yeah, big, that's a big key right there. Um, yeah, man, I love, I love the, hearing you talk about the process because I can tell it's something that you've you've honed you've really honed your process and something that uh, you correct me if I'm wrong but it feels like you have consciously honed it's not just like oh yeah it's kind of muscle right. memory I kind of just do this because I do this it's like no you've thought this process through and rethought it through and you have systems in place and it sounds like yeah. a team um so that you can really really maximize it which is dope because I think sometimes you know in our world of music people are good at maybe that part of the brain that's that is sort of the out there creative part which is so important but maybe doesn't have the patience or just you know right. doesn't see the value in okay i'm gonna like map out my process and maybe even document it in some kind of way so that i can actually bring on team members and and know you know and, and not have to start from scratch every time but actually have those processes in place um right. so I, I know at least on my side that that's been a big part of i think being able to accomplish certain things is just just having those processes and, and being willing to have a little bit of patience and, and take a little bit of extra time to to write out that checklist or, or you know, create right. some kind of documented process so that you can repeat it. And eventually your your team or whoever else, you know, that you can do it. And actually, you know, what's dope, too, is another little element that that's uh, been added for me in the last couple of years is now that I teach this stuff is it's like there's like three things going on. It's like, OK, I'm going to make this you know i'm going to do this task but then i'm going to make it more efficient for myself by documenting so i have my my right. checklist plus that's also going to make it so now i can hand it off to you know somebody else eventually and bring on the team plus this new thing of that process itself becomes this asset because i can teach that process you exactly. know what i mean so so that's been dope and i'll, I'll <laughs> sorry i'll bring you back in a second here no, you're good well, but that's your that's <laughs> i think one of the brilliant things about the way that you approach your business man but go ahead keep continue no, I was just going to bring that back into it's dope because I, I saw like that you and Realistic were doing this recently. And I know it's something that you do often um, where you're taking people through that process where you are teaching this process. Right. Right. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to bring it to that because that it just looks super dope. I know you're the last one I saw was you guys were mixing or you were mixing a Rick Ross record and you're actually going to like take people through that exact process. Like, oh, that's so that's so dope. That's such a cool idea. That's like, you know, something that's really going to help people. So I just wanted to hear more about that process where where'd you come up with with that idea it's one of those things where it's like oh that sounds that's so obvious because it sounds like it's a great idea but i haven't really seen people do it i appreciate it man um so people people know me as the guy that's always like 
when you when you used to come to sessions with me when I did tons of recording, and I mean, you know, even just years ago, even now, like um, what people will tell you, like a black metaphor will tell you or in any way, it's like, I'm always teaching stuff. It doesn't matter if I know something and it's going to help you, I'm going to tell you. That's just the, my nature. I don't feel protective of information like that. Um, because if when I'm not protecting information and I'm sharing information, it gives me motivation to learn new things so I can stay ahead of myself. You know what I mean? I can keep growing. Um, so it's my own self accountability thing, you know, but anyway, so I'm always teaching stuff. So I started doing, um, these classes in person, um, in another studio that I had two studios ago, I started doing classes in person and those were, went super well. Um, and basically we would, you know, we would, mix records right there in the class and i would explain to people um how, what sound is and how because the most difficult thing about mixing i think is that most people don't understand that sound what actual sound is and the way your brain perceives sound are usually or not usually but they're often not the same thing and so if, if you you may think to yourself well i need more um I need more high end out of this sound, right? So then you start boosting the high frequencies. But in reality, a lot of times you just need to reduce other frequencies that are not necessary that will cause the brain's perception of the sound to be brighter, you know, um, without adding volume to the high end, which then it's like a, you know, a domino effect across, you know, everything that you're doing. Um, right. So what I, what I do is, um, and recently, you know, Realistics has been joining me as I zoom and I um, stream directly through Pro Tools. Um, so you're not hearing, um, you're not hearing like, you know, sound through a microphone or something. So I zoom through Pro Tools, you know, um, and I and I just basically walk people through from scratch, like completely strip away what you perceive sound to be and alter it. And that's all I literally have people like Grammy winners and all kinds of folks that that visit the class to learn. Um, and it and it's like it's like, damn, I never thought about it like that. But these slight perspective shifts create massive impact on on the way that you operate because it affects every sound you choose, the way you mix, the way you like it just affects everything, you know, even the way you record, because you can't unhear once you've done it, you just can't unhear things like every thing that you hear going forward is going to be different. I'm going to send you a, um, I'm going to send you a um, thing to, to visit the next class if you have time so that you can kind of check it Bro, out. But, definitely. I was um, about to ask. Yeah, in it's, fact, it's this might be a good time to 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 plug real quick because it's so dope. I do want to check it out. I know people are probably listening right now. Like, how do I? How do I check this out? So I know it's oh, it's sure. Amon Jackson.com, right? A M O N D Jackson.com. And then they look for sound essentials. And I believe you were generous enough to give us a little discount code, right? Whereas I think it was sure. Mini Money 50, uh, where you can get a discount to to come come check out this this super dope process that I'm 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 definitely gonna be on the next one myself. For sure. That's gonna be dope, man. Later, the last one we did, um, you know, Grammy winning producer Bink joined me and um he sent me a record he had done uh, with Rick Ross and we compared it to, usually I mix records um, in the class that I actually mixed. In mm -hmm. this class, um, the homie just sent me um, a session, like a session for a record that was already published. Uh, Cause we don't want to play with a Rick Ross record that was unreleased. Like this is just not, right. you know what I'm saying? So he sent me that joint and we mixed the beat in the class. And then we mixed the vocal in the, it's a two part class, a beat mixing class. And then a vocal mixing class. You got to do them both because they, yep. they are kind of codependent on each other. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it was so much fun. I was supposed to teach for four hours between the two classes. So two mm -hmm. hour class, two hour class. I went for nine hours, bro. Whoo. <laughs> I'd be so That's excited awesome. about, yeah, dude, I get so excited about it. Sometimes it just goes that way. Sometimes, you know, we do the two hours and it's impactful. And sometimes, you know, we expand it beyond that because the conversation is so good and, and it's just coming out of me. And it's like, you know, the students just get it. You know what I mean? And they, they get to receive that. Um, That's so, and, and they get a chance cool. to interact too, right? If they have questions or they want to. Oh yeah. So no. there's a, there's an actual Q and a, but we almost never do it. Um, and the reason why is because the, it's such a open conversation while the mixing is happening um, that they 
they're welcome to ask questions during, unless I have a ton of students in the class, they're usually, you know, welcome to talk, you know, like ask questions while we're actually in the class. And that's something realistic is helpful about too, is like if somebody puts a comment in the chat because they don't want to interrupt something I'm saying, then he'll be like, hey, you know, such and such had a question and then I'll invite them in to, you know, to speak. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not in seminar mode, like where it's just me talking, you know, it's like literally this is the same way you and I are where, you know, everybody's in the class, anybody can unmute if they need to unmute and we can talk. And the best thing I think, um, is in order for me to test whether or not people are understanding what I'm teaching, um, I will usually let them remote into the session so that I can watch them try the thing that I'm teaching to see if it's actually, if they actually get it. Um, so, yeah, smart. so it's like- you Bro, I love get... this. This is like, I feel like it's like the future of learning, you know what I mean? And that sort of like old school kind of classic lecture, you know, uh, like, like generic college style of learning is, is gonna lose, you know, right. as there's more people like you pushing the boundaries of like, this is what it means to learn. Because to me, there's no better way to learn than to actually see somebody actually do the thing and then right. be able to interact and, and be able to try it yourself. Like, it's just so dope. I, I think that's really cool what you're doing. I yeah, appreciate it, man. It's pretty yeah. cool to like, even for the new people, the new school folks, like you, you're you just now starting out as a as a artist or a producer or an engineer. And then you're actually putting your mouse on a Rick Ross vocal from your crib. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, what? You know, like, because <laughs> bro, the first time I did it, it was on the Playboy Cardi record and I didn't, it didn't dawn on me that that was going to be special to people. I really just wanted to check and see if the class understood what I was saying. So I right. was like, hey, find find this inside. Find, find, I was like, find this annoying frequency that I'm hearing right now. Find this annoying. What do you find annoying? And then I remoted people in one by one and they did it. And then somebody did a post that was like, oh, my God, I just touched a Playboy Cardi record. And I was right. like, oh, damn, I didn't even think about that. You know what I mean? Wow. So dope. Cool. no, I, I can, I can relate, uh, of just like, I remember the first time I got to mix some Snoop vocals, it was, um, my buddy, yeah. Mr. Fab, who's out here, uh, you know, in the Bay area where, where I'm at, um, he'd gotten Snoop on a record a while back. And so I got to mix it and I just remember like soloing the tracks. It was just, it was so dope. Cause that's somebody who I grew up listening to, who, you know, helped make me fall in love with hip hop, you know, so, so long ago. And so there's something, nice. uh, surreal about that. And I think that there's also something really important psychologically about, um, I mean, first of all, it's just super fun and it's exciting, right? right but it's also right. like the, the, the mindset thing of like, sometimes it feels like there's this mystique and this, this magic and this untouchable thing about music where it's like, ah, like, you know, it, it feels like that's something that's maybe untouchable, especially if it's a producer who's, you know, earlier in their in their career or, or they're just starting out or they've never they've never been in the room with with a, a bigger artist or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, just having that proximity of just being able to take over your computer and actually play with the Rick Rocks vocal. I think that that's that really can change somebody's whole perspective of like, oh, no, wait, this is possible. Like, that Rick Ross is just a person and they when when you hit record it looks the same as when I record my homie over here and like those types of mindset shifts are actually really powerful and that you see that that type of thing is possible and then that allows you to actually take the actions to you know uh progress in your career I don't know if I'm explaining that well but there's just there's no, just something I'm, about like I'm glad that you experience it. yeah I'm glad you mentioned it because it's you know I for me I love learning you know, just as much as I love teaching. And so the way I'm, I'm also into um, language because like language, I sometimes I will ask people to repeat, like I'll say, hey, what am I getting ready to do? And the, they'll they'll respond and say, well, you know, you get ready to do this. And I'll be like, but how do we say it? You know what I mean? And, it, and the reason I do that is because I want you, it's like we're creating mantras. I want you to to really digest these words this exact way because it's a perspective thing that mm. really does wind up being way more powerful for you and serves you more if you use this language when you talk about this thing you know what i mean so i'm really glad that you brought that up it's a it's a very um it's very disarming you know what i mean and it removes a lot of that fear of because they're, if they're watching me do these records for these large art, the large name artists, it's like, you know, including Snoop, right? So it's like, if they're watching something like that, then it helps them to feel um, 
like it's like you're taking like you said it's like you're you're peeling off the layers of all of this um mystery you know what i mean mm -hmm. or all of this yeah. um you know makes it feel this... real it just makes it feel possible right yeah because it, sure. it's like well if i can if, you know i'm watching you do this and you're applying the same things you're teaching us i can apply them to anything you right. know what i mean so you know it's like when you're watching how high level records get mixed um then it it does make you more confident that you know what you're doing when you work on your own stuff or you work on you get opportunities to work on other you know large artist stuff and it's just it just sets people up on the right career path if they are newer in the game and it and it gives people a very refreshing um recalibration if they are very seasoned you know the seasoned guys love it man because it's like damn i did i've been doing this all this all these years i've been doing this and i've been missing opportunities to do all this other stuff too you know mm -hmm. what i mean it kind of opens the uh people's mind to some to some different things so um yeah man yeah for Definitely. sure um what about from like you know switching gears over to kind of like the marketing and the business side of things for sure. um so i see like you know the link in your bio is is going to those classes so is that sort of the as far as when you're putting out content and stuff like that is that where you're mostly directing people are you also picking up you know mixing gigs what what's like you know because i i think what you're doing there with that class those classes to me is super interesting um and and unique and it's also the most scalable right because you can only mix so many records but you can virtually bring on you know a bunch of people and that's something that can grow and grow um, so I'm Definitely. just curious about kind of your, your thinking process for that. And, you know, how, how, how are you promoting it? Um, right now I don't do, I don't do the ads. I don't do like, literally I just make content mm -hmm. and people tend to gravitate toward the content and then, um, a little bit of affiliate. Um, and that's usually because, you know, there's people I respect where, you know, I haven't adopted their audience yet and they haven't necessarily adopted my audience or, you know, they may not know that we're connected. So like, uh, you know, like realistics people may not may not have known at first that we were connected in some way. Mm -hmm. So it's like, all right, when he does something, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, I didn't know that they I fought. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, yeah, ah, got it. Um, So that helps for for me. Everything that I've done since the beginning of my career has been word of mouth. Um. So Sound Essentials is very different for me because I'm actually making promotional material for it. And I've mm -hmm. never done that before. Everything with mixing has been, you know, like such and such tell, you know, Diamond Details, Talib Kweli, Talib Kweli, Tell Buster Rhymes. Like it's, sure. it's not really, you know, it was never really like a, like a promotional thing, which, you know, from, for, with mixing, I kind of don't, know that i'll ever really promote in that way mm -hmm. yeah um because i i think probably the I, your audience for that because you have to think about when when you're promoting something who's your audience and where is your audience so like talib Kweli is probably not going to click on a facebook ad to have somebody mix his <laughs> record he's gonna right. you know get the person that was referred by his friend um right. so i think that makes sense like it's just what's the market who's the audience and how do you best reach that audience now for sound essentials, you know, that might be an up and coming producer who is eventually going to work with Talib Kweli or whoever, um, but right. they might be scrolling through Instagram and looking at like, man, how, you know, that would be dope if I could try mixing a Talib Kweli, you know, record right now. Oh, cool. Amon Jackson's going to show me how, and I click right. that. So I think it's just, it's just market fit and figuring out where, where that person's at. Yeah, but that's exactly, dope. So, man. Yeah. Uh, so, so you are doing some uh, specifically like promotional stuff uh, yeah, absolutely. on that side. Yeah. Yeah, I mostly, I mostly, um, what I've learned is that my audience likes when I speak. Um, so I've been doing that and I've, I've been, uh, asking for testimonials from people, um, nice. after the class, cause I get tons of DMS after the classes and, um, which is very humbling, man. Like sometimes it's emotional, like how humbling it is because people, you know, people are really fighting out here, trying to, trying to understand what to do next you know what i mean and how to develop and how to grow and then they take the class and they wind up coming out of it so different than they came in that they're like emoting and then it Dope. kind of can you know what i mean it can kind of just be humbling man and and um but anyway so i've gathered 
a ton of testimonials um, all the way from multi-platinum producers and Grammy winning producers um, to just brand new people who have, you know, who just happened to take the class. And um, that's such a that's such a gem, by the way, is just I recommend that for everybody, whenever you can try to, you know, grab those testimonials. If somebody does DM you screenshot it, you know, ask them if they if they can create a quick video, Um, you know, it can feel kind of weird at first. But once you get used to it, it just becomes natural to do. And then that becomes so powerful. And like, I think I know I could do an even better job of it. And I'm just looking on your site. It's like, I don't see those testimonials, you know, the more you can put those everywhere. Um, it just helps. It, it gives people, you know, it gives people proof of like, oh yeah, okay. This is, this is legit. This has helped people. Um, so getting those, those testimonials helps really helps build that, that trust. Yeah. That's, I discovered that, um, I did this one post and, and what I decided to do was put a quote in the caption. Uh, you know, like you, it's kind of like a, like a meme in a way, you know, like mm-hmm. you can put a border. So like in the border, I put a quote you know, um, that somebody said inside of their testimonial. Um, so before you even, you know, and I did a carousel on IG. So before you even go to the next, um, before you even watch the video, you can see what the quote is, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? And I think that was super power. A lot of people signed up from that, um, from that alone, because what, what happened is man. So I prefaced the video by saying, look, somebody had hit me up and they were like, bro, I'm so grateful for the class. You don't know how many people I paid to do, um, to do these classes and I'm not learning anything. And it's like, it's almost feels like a scam. And so I wound up posting something about that as a joke. You know what I mean? About all the, all these guys that have all these really corny ads and stuff that like, like nobody even knows you like as a musician, like, um, so I posted all that kind of stuff and people started hitting me up and telling me how many times they'd been scammed. Mm. So I was like, yo, for real. So I just did a short video that said, Hey, look, I was just joking. Um, I didn't know you guys were having these kind of problems out there taking these classes and not getting your ROI. So, um, Instead of me talking about my class, let me let you hear from some people who have and just go ahead and swipe and then they swipe and it's just, you know, one person after the other. Um, So I'm getting ready to do one uh, probably next week. That's going to have a guy from the UK or a guy from London, two guys from France, um, two different guys from Hawaii, uh, one guy from India, one guy from... um, uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, a guy from uh, Puerto Rico. And so it's like it. I'm going to do like an international one for this one um, only because I want for people in other marketplaces to see that this is not just happening here. Like there's literally like, legit like we had a um, a guy, uh, my guy, Ratet. See, and that's the thing, too, is we develop relationships from stuff like this. So mm-hmm. so now this guy, Ratesh, is like he has a standing appointment with me once a week and we do a one on one. And so Ratesh was up at like three in the morning to take my class the mm-hmm. first time. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's like that's super cool, man, like uh, that. It's so anyway, that's the the marketing side of it, I think, is um, it's always good to let other people talk for you because you I mean, you can say whatever you want about yourself. It's really good for people to see that other people are willing to. To compliment it and they're not like, you know what, I took AJ Sound Essentials course and it was the best thing I ever did. You know, (laughs) it's like, honestly, just being honest, like, yo, I met this guy during this time. I can't believe how much I've learned from here to here. And it is being honest. And I love that. So yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a powerful tool for um, converting people, you know, um, because I mean, if you have a good product, it's like, let people talk about it. It's a good product, you know, exactly. Good product. I, they say a good product sells itself. It don't. Right. Um, of course it not. really doesn't. <laughs> but having a good product is, is the gold at the end of the rainbow. Right. So you want to yeah. like, you know what I mean? As people show people the rainbow so they can get to the gold. And then when they get there, they'll be happy that they went, you know, you're not selling them something that's not actually effective. Like I love, I love what you do because it's effective. You know what I mean? In terms yeah. of um, the way that you're guiding people into how to market what they're doing, it's effective. 
you know and so and like what i do with with you know teaching people about sound is effective so when they pay for it they feel great about it afterwards so they want to talk about it for sure so i'm going to take advantage of that and i'm going (laughs) to spread the word you know definitely definitely yeah and then sprinkling those things in as as ads you know in your emails um and and specifically on an order form page by the way is one of the best places to put testimonials because it's like the what that last little thing that kind of creates that trust um and and then you know we'll, we'll help you increase your conversions there um but man what um what, what do you got coming up next? What are, what are you excited about these days? I mean, I know you got the next uh, Sound Essentials coming up. Yep. Um, and anything else that you're you're excited about? You're working on records, projects, Yeah, this something. is the thing that sucks, man. You know, in, engineering is very much, um, it's very much like you're a vault. You know what I'm saying? So all the really cool things that I want to talk about are things that have non-disclosure agreements and just G code. You just can't say anything. Um, but I worked on something not too long ago that the world will find out that I would have turned down. If the choice was to do this or Beyonce record, I would have turned down the Beyonce record. Well, and yeah, bro, it's so big and I cannot (laughs) even, you can't say it. Do we have like a release date or anything or no, I don't, man. I don't know. And it's something, I'll tell you once once it happens, I'll tell you and you'll be like, yeah. oh, shit. We'll, um, we'll, we'll let the we'll let the MIDI money community know as well, because now now I feel like we opened up that loop. We got to we got to tell them for show, sure, man. It's, a, it's exciting. <laughs> I got my after all these years, I got my first gold record last week. Ooh, um, congratulations. Thank you. Which was really crazy because it's I've done like you said, it's like I've done Ross Future Thug like you name it, bro. Like I've 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 done it. And so but this it was a T Grizzly record. Um, which is not what I was anticipating being the first one. So um, there's another one coming, but it hasn't been announced yet, so I won't say it. Um, but yeah, which is interesting because that's going to be like within months. I went from like working on music from being 16 years old to being 44, and then my first gold comes. And which is when talking about it, you know, because you love the drop gems, it comes, bro. Like it. it first of all, life changing music is not measured by plaques. Like that's that's you know life changing um, work is not measured by um, Grammys. So, but it's nice to have them. You know what I'm saying? So sure. it it is um, it is great that it that it did finally happen. But in the music community, I the we, there's people like we love each other because of how much we've contributed to each other's careers. And there's tons of fans who have listened to the music that I've worked on. I, I remember one day, I know I know we're trying to uh trying to knock this one part of it out, but I remember this one day, man. I was thinking to myself, like, damn, I've never been to um I've never been to London, you know? And then I realized like, well, my music's my work has been to London a lot. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's tons mm-hmm. of listeners mm-hmm. in London. So sure. my spirit energy is there, you know. Um, so don't get caught up in all this other stuff. You know, my guy focused three dots. He told me that a long time ago. He's like, yo, don't focus on the plaques and Grammys and stuff, man. Just keep doing what you're doing, make your money and it'll eventually come. So, yeah. So that's, you know, that's a thing that's going on. Um, what else is there? Damn, there's so much. That's a lot right there. Sucks, (laughs) bro. There's so much I can't talk about. It totally sucks, man. But it's just part of how it goes. Is um, it is uh, you know, I always let the artist announce things or the producer announce things before, you know, um, I announce anything as a mixer. So yeah, I've got some really cool stuff that um that I'm excited about that I'm gonna call my mom about. You know what I mean? Like (laughs) there you go. (laughs) <laughs> Once it's announceable, I'm gonna call my mom's about it. For sure, so. for sure. And that's also dope that you're you're having a lot of success on that side of things, but you're also doing your own thing. So of course you can talk about, you know, you can talk about sound essentials because that's your project. You know right. what I mean? So having that ownership I think is dope that you're you're doing both sides of it. I think sometimes it's hard to um, you know, juggle both of those because I feel like sometimes you need to really focus on one thing to become great at that thing but once you kind of got your systems your people your processes in place for this thing now you can build on that next thing and that next thing and i think that's um 
I'm sure it's got to be why you've been able to have success in these multiple areas is because you are somebody who creates that process and then puts the systems right. in place, whether that's the tools, the people, you know, the, that, that checklist, the SOP, whatever it might be, um, so that that thing can keep going and keep growing without you having to do all of that um, so right. that you can, you know, do all these multiple things. So I just, I think it's super dope, man. I'm, I'm glad I got a chance to, uh, you know, connect with you. Um, and I'm excited to go check out the next, uh, the next sound essentials, but, um, yeah, man, we're, yeah. we're about to wrap up here, but, um, man, anything you want to close out on, uh, let people know, you know, where they can find you. Um, and, uh, yeah. and anything else, uh, you know, anything else you want to let people know, man, just, um, well, number one, thanks for having me. It's, it's great to finally be able to sit down. Um, we, like I said, we have a lot of mutual, um, this is, we just, we have a lot of mutual people. So yeah. Sure. Well, it'll start to unfold over time, but um, I would say, so I'm Simon Jackson on everything, like literally, you know, efficiency, like you said, you know, is uh, Adamon Jackson, A-M-O-N-D Jackson on everything. And Sound Essentials is coming up. I may do a short burst training, which is a small training before actual Sound Essentials on the 13th of November, because um, those are fun. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a whole lot. Just, you know, follow me, you know, Follow me and uh, I, I teach a lot. I love what I do. You know what I mean? And um, you're already following Legion. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like you're following MIDI money. You know, it's, it's you're already tapped in with these guys. So, you know, just uh, I guess just tap in with me. You know, looking forward yeah, to meeting you guys. And I do I do love mixing producer records. So don't be afraid just because I mix like really expensive records and stuff. Don't be afraid to reach out to me if you want me to make some beats or um, you're trying to shop some beats and you want to get them right before you send them out. Or, you know, you, you get a placement with a dope artist and you want to, you know, um, not met, botch the opportunity up and get it professionally done. I try to, I try to really work with producers because I, I think producers, um, people don't do enough to help producers get into the space they're trying to get into. There's not just not a whole lot of like things that you can grab when you're climbing, you know, as a producer. Right. So um, if you if you have some stuff that you're trying to get done, I try to be a little bit more flexible if you're independent and not charge like, you know, Sony record publishing prices and stuff like that. So Dope. yeah, that's well, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, we'll go amonjackson.com, A-M-O-N-D. Go check out the uh, the Sound Essentials. Use that MIDI Money 50 for the discount. Amon, really appreciate you. Looking forward to, you know, I feel like this is this is the first time we really had a, a conversation. I know we got a lot of people in common, so I'm, I'm looking right. forward to working more together and, and, and chatting more. But man, this has been great. Appreciate you. You got it, man. I roll.